Good morning. Our call to worship is from Psalm 23. Will you stand and we'll sing it together? As we confirm our students, this is a chance for us to affirm our call to discipleship and affirm our faith together. Let's join. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Jesus promises, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, will have the light of life. There is one body and one spirit. There is one hope in God's call to us. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Let us affirm the faith we have received. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. move over here. Um, as Ryan mentioned, uh, we'll be receiving students to be confirmed, so I want to go ahead and invite uh, Sam and Hartland and Quinn to come forward. You can stand here in front of the communion table. This is a, a special Sunday in the life of our church, and uh, just, just want to, there's a note in the order, but I just want to, uh, well, first I should start. So this is Sam Fogarty here, closest to me, Quinn Worley, and Heartland to one guy. And so we're very thankful for the three of you. Uh, this is a special Sunday in the life of our church. And you'll see a note that uh, over the last academic year, uh, I've, had the, I've had the privilege of spending time with these students. And we've asked two questions primarily of who am I and, and what is the church? And then also they did some work on their own with a, a journal studying the scriptures. And so it's a great, uh, exciting time to be able to talk about those things and have them come to affirm their faith. Confirmation, the way that we think about it as a church, is it's a chance to recognize personal maturity, a kind of a, a growth. It's also a chance for them to uh, confirm the name Christian for themselves and then for them to join the church based on their profession of faith and desire to live it out among us. So, so I'm going to ask uh, the three of you these questions as a way for you to affirm your faith in Christ and desire to join the church. Um, so let me, you can answer, I do. Uh, so let me ask these, these questions to you. Do you believe in the one living and true God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit? Do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, and without hope save in God's sovereign mercy? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and Savior of sinners? And do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered in the gospel? And do you rely on the grace of God and the power of the Spirit, promising to confess Christ publicly before others and seek to live as a follower of Christ? Do you promise to share fully in the life of the church, to be faithful in worship and service, and to offer your support and gifts? And do you promise to accept the spiritual guidance of the church to walk in a spirit of Christian love with the congregation and to seek those things that make for unity, purity, and peace? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, well, um, as a way, we're going to have a moment of, of baptism and uh, kind of anointing and, of, and oil with this God, acknowledging God's spirit. But before that, I think it's nice for us to be able to express our encouragement and support to, to these uh, three students. Um, confirmation is connected to baptism uh, because it is the, the, the affirmation of our identification with Christ. And so Hartland was baptized as a child, and so her professing faith is the fulfillment of that sign that she received. Uh, Quinn and, and Sam have not been baptized, so they'll be baptized now as a way to affirm again their identification with Christ. So Quinn, let me invite you over. So Quinn, what is your full Christian name? Quinn, do you desire to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit? You can kneel next to the brothers. Quinn.
Quinn, I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for Quinn. We thank you for his faith in you, and we pray, Lord, that you would guide him, that he may walk in your ways. We thank you for his grace, the, the grace for, that you have for him, and we pray that he'd find his strength, Lord, in your goodness and in your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right. Yeah, you can switch spots with Sam. There we go. Yeah. Sam, what is your what is your full Christian name? Samuel Lincoln Gilbert. And Samuel, do you desire to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit? Okay. Samuel, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray for, for Sam. Lord, we give you thanks for Sam. We thank you that you have made him and that you love him. We thank you for the grace that you've shown him in his life and even now bringing him to be identified with you, Christ, in this public way. Pray that you'd protect him and guide him. Let him be one who loves your people and loves his neighbors, that he may be a light wherever he goes. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite Adonijah to come forward and offer a prayer. But before he does that, I'm going to, it's part of the, a tradition in the church to, to anoint those who are confirmed as a sign of the Spirit. So I'm going to offer an anointing to each of the, of the students in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the lives of Sam, Hartland, and Quinn. We thank you for the work that you have done in their lives, through their families, their friends, and through the church, both in this body and elsewhere. We are filled with joy and reverence at your faithfulness as they stand before us here today and proclaim their love for and dependence on you. Help us to receive them well and continue to nurture their gifts and talents and give them opportunities to contribute to the life of this body and to your kingdom. Wherever you may take Sam, Hartland, and Quinn in the months and years to come, let this moment stand as a reminder of your presence in their, life, in their lives and the life that they'll share in you and with your people now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand together that we can offer a, a responsive blessing. Uh, you can follow along in your order of worship. Sam, Hartland, and Quinn, we give thanks for you, and we pray that the Lord bless you and keep you. In the name of Christ, we welcome you. May we grow together in unity and be built up in the body of Christ in love. To the glory of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let's, let's remain standing that we can sing together.
Please be seated. Let's pray together. Almighty God, King of Kings, faithful and true, Lord, in your grace, you have given us minds to know you, hearts to love you, voices to sing your praise. So Lord, fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your glory and worship Christ in spirit and in truth. Lord, make us aware of your presence this morning. Father, uh, meet those of us who feel full and vibrant. May we uh, persist in the strength that you provide and, and may you, Lord, use our resources, our, our gifts, even our weaknesses, Lord, to participate in your kingdom work. Father, we pray that you would also meet those of us who are wrestling with questions of faith or meet those of us who are, are troubled with, with grief and sadness. Meet those of us who endure the ways our relationships are shaken in need of restoration. Meet those of us who are worn down, who are lonely, filled with worry, and Lord, meet us in these places, in these full places, in these difficult spaces with your strength, with your love and tenderness, with your words of invitation, calling us home to find our rest in you. God, we know you are the Lord, the true King who is reigning, who is praying for all of us right now. And may we receive and believe your grace and you be changed by it. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, children are now dismissed for children's worship. Well, we turn now to our time of confession and assurance, a time where we do acknowledge with God our sin and our need of him. And we'll do this together as a, as a church and then have a time of quiet personal confession. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Lord, we pray the fruit of your Spirit may grow in us. Loving Father, you are full of kindness and mercy. You sustain us, provide for us, and remember us at all times. Yet we have not followed your ways. Forgive us for the times this week when we were harsh, indifferent, and thoughtless towards the people that you created and put in our lives.
please take a moment of quiet personal confession. Father, we confess our sin, that even when we were dead in our trespasses, you have made us alive together with Christ. That by your grace, you saved us, and you sh have shown us the immeasurable riches of your grace. So we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand together to hear the words of assurance that come to us from Philippians chapter 1. Let's join together. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Well, as we've been welcomed into God's family, let us also welcome each other in the name of Christ. Thank you. 
Reading from the scriptures, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. And when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, Judas, the son of James. All these were with one accord, devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Ephesians chapter 1. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes in your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward all who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of God. Uh, good morning again. Thanks, Mark, for reading. Uh, as you see in your order of worship, we're going to look at a passage from Matthew 7, and it's uh, part of the ser series that we've been doing, that looking at the Sermon on the Mount. And this is actually the, uh, the last sermon in that series. We'll look at the conclusion of, of Jesus' sermon. Um, and but before we read our passage, I just want to mention I saw uh, an article this week, and it was talking about uh, Jakarta, the city, the capital of Indonesia. And Jakarta has 10 million people who live in the kind of city proper. As the, the article said it was half the size of New York City, as far as geographically, but 10 million people and another 20 million that live in the area. And the story read that, like all major cities, Jakarta has problems, but its most existential one is that it's sinking, it's sinking. In some places it's sinking by as much as a foot a year, if we can imagine that. Um, the sinking is due partly to climate change and the, the sea that surrounds the city is rising. And also another factor is that uh, a number of wells are being dug to seek clean water and deflating the marshes that are underneath the city. And I mentioned that maybe it's, it's hard for me, maybe it's you know, hard for you as well to imagine that existential challenge, right, of being in a place where the waters are rising. The waters are rising. Well, Jakarta is the fastest sinking city, but I asked Google for a list, and other cities that are sinking are New Orleans, Venice, Amsterdam, and Miami Beach, just to name a few. Well, I mentioned that for us to try to kind of capture the, the significance of that, of waters rising, of the fear, uncertainties that brings, because our passage doesn't mention sinking cities, 
but our passage does mention rising waters. Rising waters. Jesus tells of two buildings and two foundations. One foundation of rock that endures and one foundation of sand that gives way. The waters rise and one building stands and the other building falls. And interesting, what we see in our passage is that Jesus identifies his words, his words as the rock. Those who hear my words and do them are like a wise builder who builds on rock, on a sure foundation. Well, as we read this, I hope that we can see that this closing image to the sermon is like the rest of the sermon, that why it's interesting and all sorts of things that Jesus is teaching ultimately invites us to Jesus himself, to the risen one, to the one who has overcome, to the one who speaks words of life and truth. So let's look at our passage. This is from Matthew 7, verse 24 through 29. You can follow in your order or uh, read along in your Bible. This is Jesus teaching. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. This is God's word, and it's given for our good. And as we reflect on this close to the Sermon on the Mount, I I wanna ask us two questions and have those two questions guide our sermon. The, The two questions, the first one is, what is our foundation? And the second is, who is this preacher? Not me, Jesus I'm talking about. (laughs) You don't want to, yeah, we don't have to ask about who I am. Uh, What is, so start start the first one. What is our foundation? What is our foundation? So there's two builders, two houses, two foundations, and two outcomes. And and the contrast that Jesus sets, you know, throughout the, the image is the contrast between hearing and doing. On one hand, there is the person who hears these words of mine and does them. On the other hand, there is those who hear my words and does not do them. After setting this contrast, Jesus then illustrates it with a parable of two building projects, right? The wise builder who digs deep and finds a strong foundation. And is the other builder who is content to just build a house and, and do it upon the sand. As these two builders engage in their projects as the the houses start to take shape, the casual observer, one who's just passing by, would not be able to tell the difference between the two, right? Most of the time we can't see the foundations of the buildings that we see. The difference between the two builders and the two homes only comes to light when the great storm arrives, the rain, the flood, the winds, the rising waters. One house stands and one falls. And Jesus is inviting us to think about the wise builder versus the foolish one. The difference between hearing and doing. There's a couple observations I I want us to to, to note as we look at this passage. The first one being that, that Jesus anticipates that storms will come upon our lives. See, that the, the, the story, the image, it assumes that storms will beat upon the houses. Seasons of heavy rains will come. Storms will strike against the house with great force. Do you see the language Jesus uses? It, they'll beat against the house. And many of you don't need me to remind you of that reality that even now there are storms that are blowing against some of our lives the winds of sorrow, the rising waters of difficult or painful circumstances that threaten our security or or threaten our plans. And it's in such storms, it's right, it's in the time of storms that we think about our homes, about our roof, or maybe our basement if we have one. 
It's only during the times of when the waters are rising that we even think about our foundations. What's going to happen? So Jesus tells us that this is part of the life that we live. The second observation is that in this story, both builders experience the storm and both builders hear Jesus' words. But the point of contrast is that one of them, one of them does what he hears. You see, the focus of this closing image that Jesus gives is is not on intellectual knowledge. It's not even on kind of the verbal affirmation of faith. Like those things are greatly important, right? To know what we believe or to express what we believe. But here Jesus is focusing on as he closes his time in the sermon, he's highlighting obedience. This idea of doing, of putting into action what we receive from him. In the image of the rising waters, Jesus warns about building our lives on sand. And he equates such a foundation as to hear his words, but not do them. It's worth maybe thinking for a moment what that might look like. We, you and and me, we build on sand when we go around angry all the time when we hold hate for others, when people can't trust what we say, when we stir up trouble instead of seeking peace, when our religious activities are about showing other people, when we center our lives on treasures just simply here on earth. You and me, we we build on the sand when we become proficient at spotting the speck in the other person's eye, but overlooking the log in our own. When we're content with seeing others as objects of our lust. When we practice retaliation, when we get good at getting even. Jesus is inviting us, as he's done throughout the sermon, to see that such ways of being do not lead to life. That building on the sand, such houses are destined to fall. These two observations help us see that that this parable, ultimately, Jesus is offering us two possibilities or two different foundations. And he sets this contrast in order for us to ask, for us even to hear him ask, what is our foundation? What is our foundation? Who do we hear and and what are we doing? And he asks that question. I think he sets this contrast in order to invite you and me to make a wise choice, to to look honestly at ourselves and to ask how we're building our home and to make a choice to seek his foundation. The author Soren Kierkegaard has a line that relates to this. He he writes that Jesus never asks for admirers. Jesus never asks for admirers. No, he calls disciples. Consistently speaks of follow. Come follow me. He goes on to say, what's the difference between an admirer and a follower? A follower is one who who does or who strives to be like what he admires, to be like what he values. But an admirer is one who simply keeps his or her distance detached, not thinking about the fact that what is admired might have a claim on how he or she lives. And so Jesus tells us this image at the end of his sermon to ask us, are we admirers or are we followers of him? Are we hearing and doing or simply hearing? Jesus makes a promise that if you build your life on the firm foundation of my words, your life will stand even in the storm. It's clear that it's important to note that his promise is not that the storms will stop. He does not say that the waters will stop rising. Rather, he makes the promise that his words will be like a rock 
that endure. So Jesus invites us into this question of what is our foundation? What are we building our house, our life upon? That's the first question. But the second question is important as well, and that is who is this preacher? So you notice that after this closing image, there is also this note from Matthew about how people responded to what Jesus said. The Sermon on the Mount takes up chapters 5, 6, and 7 of, of Matthew's gospel, and it opens by telling us that there was great crowds, and seeing these great crowds, Jesus went up on the mount and sat down to teach. And now when it concludes, how, how, did, how do they respond? Do you notice? What, what does it say? That they are astounded. They are astonished. They're astonished because Jesus teaches as one with authority. Or we could say he, they've never heard someone speak like this before. And so part of the sermon is not just for us to wonder about our foundation, but to even ask, who is this person speaking? Who is this preacher? Jesus has said all, had all sorts of interesting things through the sermon. Some of the things that we might have been new to us, some of the things that we might have already known. You know, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Love your enemies. No one can serve two masters. Judge not, lest you be judged. Whatever you wish others to do to you, do so for them. And we know if we hear these, right, that these are powerful words. And we can feel the, the truth in them. But what the sermon invites us over and over again is, is not just to hear the words, but to consider the uniqueness of this teacher himself. I say to you, Jesus says, as I was thinking about these powerful words that came to my mind, I'm not exactly sure why, but I remember that, that on my father's desk when I was growing up, he had this glass paperweight. I don't know do people use paperweights anymore in the paperless office. <laughs> but this glass paperweight was always fascinating to me. It actually belonged to my grandfather and then became part of my, my dad's on his desk. It was this kind of globe of glass that had a flat bottom. And it was kind of opaque, but inside there was kind of a glass design of purple and red and yellow. And I, for whatever reason, as a child, it was always interesting to me. And I can still remember, though, when I went to go pick it up or I'd hold it, that it always weighed more than what I'd expected it to weigh. And maybe you can think of something like that. You pick up and you note the solidness of it, the weight, that this, this is made of something real, <laughs> And if you can picture something like that or that feeling that this, there's a heaviness, a, a, a weight to this, I'm inviting us to think about Jesus' words in that way. Not only are they interesting, not only are they helpful, but there is a weight and a solidness to them. These words, I speak to you, are not small things not little home improvements. These words I speak to you are foundational words, words that build a life upon, words that set destinies, words that reveal what is true, words that determine, tell us who we are. In Matthew 5 through 7, the only person who opens his mouth the whole time is Jesus. There's no dialogue, no questions, no vocal response. All attention is focused on this one person who is speaking. So what is this great weight? What is the great importance of the sermon? And I want us to see clearly it's Jesus himself. It would be a mistake just to take some notes from the Sermon on the Mount and, and miss the one who's actually saying the words. See, Jesus assumes for himself this place of authority, the place of the law, the place of God's word, I say to you, these words I speak to you are foundational words. Who is this preacher? And we need to note that he speaks as one who's been given all authority on heaven and earth. He speaks as one who has faced all things, faced even sin and death, and has overcome he speaks as the risen, ascended one, given the name above all names. To say it another way, he speaks as God himself. 
And as we close, I just want to highlight that it's possible for us to hear this parable today about the, the wise and the foolish builder, and it's possible for us to make a mistake. And I want us to be clear as we close about that mistake. It's, it's possible for us to conclude that the foundation of, of our life is actually our good choices. That I did what Jesus said, so look, I had, now, now there's my foundation. But that would be inaccurate. That would be a mistake. The rock that Jesus offers is not you and I figuring out what to do or doing it right. The rock is him. The unchanging word of God in flesh. Peter Kreft, who is a, a theologian and author, he writes this, and I think it's really helpful. The essence of Christianity is not the Sermon on the Mount. When Christianity was proclaimed to the ends of the earth, the proclamation was not, love your enemies. The proclamation, rather, was, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. The essence of Christianity is not an ideal, but rather it's an event, it's a proclamation, it's good news. He goes on to say, the essence of Christianity is not Christianity. The essence of Christianity is Christ. Jesus, the risen Son of God. And this is what we have to hold and remember, that the foundational words of life are Jesus himself. He's told us he is the gate. He is the true path. He is the good tree that brings forth good fruit. And now he is the word that brings life as a foundation in the midst of storms. And what I hope that we can see, he's calling us beyond ourselves, beyond our strengths, beyond our plans, beyond our wisdom, beyond our resources. As the waters are rising, he's calling us to entrust our very lives, our homes, to him the one who has taken on flesh, our God who has walked through the storms, the one who knows what it is to have the winds beat upon you, and he has overcome. Take heart, for I have overcome the world, Jesus says. Let us build our house upon that promise. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you, Lord, that you are gracious to us to speak words of truth and to invite us to rest in your work on our behalf. Please meet us this day by your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Will you please stand with us? And we'll sing together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame,
Almighty God, you are rich in mercy and steadfast in loving kindness toward your people. In your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, you have shown us the immeasurable riches of your grace and kindness toward us. For it is by grace that we have been saved through faith, and now we join with your people on earth and all the company of heaven in the unending hymn. Having heard God's word, we're now invited to the table that God sets for his people. And as we remind ourselves each week, this is a gift from God, our creator, the one who makes this bread and the, the wine, is also our, our redeemer, the one who takes on flesh to restore us. The good news of this table is that our place in God's family, at, at the family table of God's people, our place here is because of God's gracious work for us. We have a seat at the table, not because we've done everything right or we ha will do everything the certain way. Our place at the table is through the broken body and shed blood of Christ, putting our faith and hope in him. This is the good news. And therefore, if you know of your need before God, at your, need of your sin, and have placed your hope not in yourself, but hope in Christ, then come and eat and drink. Be nourished by God's mercy and spirit for you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this table, and I pray, Lord, that you would meet us here by your spirit. Set apart this bread and cup and use them, Lord, by your spirit to strengthen us, that as we come in shame, that you would lift our heads by your grace, as we come in our loneliness, that you would remind us that we are adopted in Christ, that we are your children now and forever. By your spirit, strengthen us, that we may walk not in what the world demands of us, but walk in your ways. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on the night that he was betrayed, after giving thanks, Jesus took the bread and broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I invite you to come down the center aisle to receive the bread and the cup, and you can go back on the sides. Uh, ask if you're, if you're able that you would hold the elements, that we can all eat and drink them together as one family after everyone's been served. If you're not taking communion today, we're, we're, we're thankful that you're here. We still invite you to come down the, the center aisle. You can just put your arm across your chest, and Pastor Brian or I can offer a prayer blessing for you here at the table. Those who are serving can come forward now. Let us come and receive the gifts that God has for his people.
Christ's body was broken to make us whole. Let us eat in faith. And Christ's blood was shed to cover all of our sins. Let us drink in faith. Well, I invite you to stand in response to this uh, table that we can pray and sing as God's people together. Lord Jesus Christ, you have made known to us the loving kindness of God and that we are saved not because of our righteous works, but according to his mercy. With thankfulness, let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we're going to continue our time of worship through... Uh, giving to the work of the church. And so I want to invite for the, the greeters. They have a, a gray basket. You can put your communion cup in, and then there's a silver plate. If you like to give offering, you can. Uh, you'll see a note that you can also do so uh, through the church's website if you'd like to uh, give that way or, or by text. Uh, one other note that there are there's kind of uh, black uh, information pads under the, the, the aisle closest, uh, this chair closest to the aisle. So underneath that uh, center aisle chair, you can pick up that pad and fill it out and pass it down. That would be great. You can know who you're worshiping with, um, and uh, it would be great to, to, for you to share that. Uh, if you are uh, visiting, we're really glad that you've joined us today. Thanks for uh, being here for the worship. And uh, just a note for everybody, especially for those who are visiting, that there is a time of coffee and bagels afterwards, and today there's cake. You hear that? There's cake. So a celebration of confirmation. Uh, there's cake along with your bagel. Um, and it's to my right. If you, if you, uh, it's going to be outside near the turf field. So uh, if you go out the gym, turn to your left, and you'll see a sign that points you outside. Uh, but I hope you can stay after. It's a chance to get to know each other and, and to celebrate um, Sam and, and Quinn and Hartland as well. So stay for some coffee, some bagels, and cake. And uh, if you have questions about the church, if you're visiting, you'd know, love to talk to Pastor Brian and myself afterwards, and we're happy to answer any questions. Um, one last note is that Taylor shared about some upcoming events. If you are interested in grabbing a book or learning more about that or filling out an RSVP, it's at the back table there uh, in the back of the gym. Let's now can, let's continue giving uh, our gifts and our worship to God. stand and join us for the doxology.
now God's blessing. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, may the love of God surround you now and always. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. May go in peace.